Hello everyone, welcome to An Evening with Birds, um, our Pi Ladies meetup for this evening. So we will be covering some natural language processing basics and some um, deeper knowledge about birds. Yeah, we have the brief community in the introduction for Pi Ladies that I'm gonna give you, then non-coding superpowers and um, introduction to birds with Rachel, a short break, Q&A, and then we go on, uh, follow with Betty and her talk about birch and Q&A also. Okay, so Pi Ladies, um, we have chapters of this uh, community group about Python programmers all around the world. Um, we started in the US and we also have actually more than the Berlin chapter in Germany. So if you're somewhere else in Germany, we have chapters in Munich, in Hamburg, and in Karlsruhe also. So get in touch with the girls if you want to um, start coding, or if you want to yeah, organize some events with us and get into coding. Uh, you don't have to be a programmer already. Yeah, it's it's all about getting started also and then getting to know the community and getting into the tech community and maybe um, yeah, kickstarting your career in tech. To give you a more clear idea, there are actually 77 chapters right now in uh, 30 countries all around the world. And you can actually um, visit this website from the New York Pi Ladies that give you a really good um, yeah, overview where everybody is. Um, we also have a code of conduct, which is important to us um, because yeah, we see it as, as, a, as a bridge <laughs> between um, Python worldwide and the tech community, but also, yeah, we want to provide a safe environment for women to get started with coding and, yeah, to have a respectful environment. And we would like to follow our events, or if you take part in it, we would like to respect your code of conduct. And you can also check our website for more information about it. <laughs> so, and more about the Berlin chapter, actually. We do have monthly meetup like this one. It's going to be online for a while, but um, yeah, as soon as we can go out again and meet, we're going to have our, our monthly meetups in Berlin and we are sometimes hosted uh, at different locations uh, in the tech community, different companies. So it's also a good opportunity for you to um, get to know other coders and other companies what to do and how they work. And it's also always interesting I think. Um, we also have full day workshops mostly twice a year and um, we also do setup events so if you just get started with coding and you don't know which IDEs to use or which would be the best um, that's the event to go to and we're gonna try to do some online events I think pretty soon. So yeah you can connect with companies we already talked about it and we also Sometimes have other crazy ideas um, like the art event, uh, Kunst event we had uh, a few months ago. So if you want to join Pi Ladies, you can also start with uh, a workshop or give a talk or just help organizing um, the workshops. And that's, we're always happy to have people join and help us as a coach also. It's always a good, good opportunity to meet other coaches. <laughs> And um, we also have a Slack channel where we all communicate if we don't um, participate in the meetups. <laughs> so if you have uh, questions about coding or about PyLadies or tech community in Berlin, this is the place to go to. And we will also use uh, Slack for Q&A. Um, so we will have an eye on the Twitch chat, but also on the Slack channel. Yeah, how to enter, go on Slack, PyLadies.com and accept the invite. And then you have to go to the City Berlin channel on Slack. That's where we are right now. Um, also, there are always a couple of other events in Berlin. Um, the Open Tech School Berlin, they do uh, their data science co-learning still, but online. It's a two week and two weeks tourism, a co-learning event where you can um, yeah, get together and work on your data science projects. Pretty nice, um, I've been there sometimes. So that's gonna be on 14th of March, it's in two days. 
But at the same time, the Python user group will also have a um, Python debugging online event. And on the 20th of May, uh, PyBellon will also have their 16th meetup online. So that's also something Python related to look forward to. And who's gonna be up today? So this is me. I'm Heike, I work as a software engineer at Dolby and um, I focus on image processing and image analysis and use Python for this and also PyTest is kind of the tool I'm using right now most of the time. And um, we also have Rachel here from all the way from Seattle actually. She works for Raza and um, she is as a linguist really um, related to NLP. And um, you can also see her live coding twice a week, mostly on her own Twitch channel. <laughs> so, and Betty uh, will be also talking about NLP. And she's from Berlin, from Boyd University, and um, works on different projects I found quite interesting also in the medical sector, um, where she helps medical professional, professionals to, um, yeah, make sense of the data of all the <laughs> um, text. So I think she can tell you more about this than I do. <laughs> okay, but first we're gonna start with our non-coding superpower introduction and I'm gonna switch slides. Yeah, I got inspired um, by a book I read and um, I was wondering how algorithmic can our life be? So. Um, algorithms for your everyday life is something I find really interesting. So can we apply algorithms to our lives? Do we want to do this? Um, yeah, I think maybe sometimes it's a good approach because it can actually improve your decision making. Um, yeah, sometimes it's quite overwhelming, especially in Berlin. If you want to look for a flat, you have, um, yes, so many um, quite many opportunities, but it's also hard to actually um, find a flat because there is even more people who are looking for a flat as well. And um, so there's actually an algorithm which can help you um, getting the time for your calibration. So you, the, at the time you're looking for the flat so that you don't, don't yeah, start too early or something. Um, and I think also um, algorithms can save you time and nerves. So, <laughs> and um, that, that quite well feeds into the decision making, I think. And um, also maybe it helps you remember better and faster. So, okay. <laughs> So algorithms for life, there is like three really interesting ones I found. One is the optimal stopping point. And um, this is quite good related to the flat hunting uh, topic. It's all about when to stop looking, but um, another one overfitting kind of prevents you from thinking too much. <laughs> and uh, so, Sometimes there is a good opportunity to just relax, right? And not to think too much about stuff. And this is all about overfitting and there's actually an algorithm for this as well. <laughs> and scheduling. So yeah, how to efficiently schedule your day or your week. We will look into two of those. So my favorite one, the optimal stopping point. <laughs> huh. See, I can give you more space here. <laughs> and so the optimal stopping point is actually a search, yeah, right? It's all about, um, yeah, flight hunting or maybe um, dating also, or you want to just find the perfect parking, parking spot in your streets or your area or shopping. Sometimes you just want to look for something and um, you wonder when you get the best, you know, pair of services or something. <laughs> um, so optimal stopping is about the um, amount of time you spend for looking and then for leaping. So you do have a calibration time. That's something I found out from the book for myself. 
they call it look and leap, but for me, it's uh, all about the calibration time. So if you have um, three months time to find a flat, you should actually be spending about one month looking for, um, yeah, checking the market and looking for your perfect street, your area, and and check out how expensive it can be. So yeah. And um, oh. Yeah, so all putting it into numbers, <laughs> um, it's 37% to be um, accurate. So a bit more than one third, but um, the optimal stopping point when you look for something, it's 37%. And um, then the calibration time should be over and you have your baseline. And after that, it's time to act. and to get the wallet out basically. <laughs> um, and I also, but I also think to, you have to pay attention to the real life problem. What I mean with this is <clears throat> um, don't be too accurate, accurate on the numbers, right? So if you actually look for your flat for like one month and then you wanna go back, but the opportunity is not there anymore, that's the real life problem. And you can not do anything about it with like another algorithm or something. Um, so another one I found really interesting is um, the scheduling algorithm. That's a sorting task. And uh, it all comes down, I think, to importance versus urgency, right? Some things are really important, but they kind of linger around with you for a while because all the urgent things, they come on top <laughs> and they come in from outside but you do want to get the important stuff done. Um, so you have to find a way to balance this out and to kind of find structure in all the tasks you have to do. Um, probably, uh, yeah, if you work in software development, you know this quite well when you have to solve your issue issues and your tickets in an agile team. So you're probably familiar with this. <laughs> and putting this into numbers, um, it's actually the case that there are so many solutions for different problems. So if you um, think about time management and all the time management guides you can have, um, there's like, the solution of getting things done like right away, which means you should do the easy stuff first and then the hard stuff because it takes longer. And it shortens your schedule list really fast, which give you, gives you a good feeling probably, but also, um, yeah, it puts the amount of tasks down to um, just a few things. But this is a, another solution, a completely different one to, uh, the, the schedule first solution where it's all about, okay, wait and schedule and think about what you do and don't just do the things right away. And there's also a different bunch of other solutions. And um, so it all depends on the problems you have. This is why there are so many, I think, approaches to it. So if you don't want to get this like out of hand, you should choose your metric first. What does it mean? You, you should um, kind of check your problem, your sorting problem or what you want to get done. And it's like, like in computer science, right? You have to choose your metric in order to know where your goals are. So um, the important thing is actually to yeah, know where you're going <laughs> and um, yeah, to, yeah, to schedule or to, to find the metric for your scheduling problem and to um, basically make your goal explicit and then it will be easier to find a solution. But um, what about the 9%? Actually, it's like this, that just 9% of all scheduling problems can be solved and the others are intraceable or unknown. <laughs> so 9% is really a small number, right? Um, but I think maybe next time when you do um, freak out a little bit about the amount of tasks you have to do, 
Um, just remember this number. <laughs> Maybe that makes things a bit easier. Just 9% of all problems can be solved. So maybe it's not, um, yeah, so relevant or so important that this one time you actually feel a bit overwhelmed with all your schedules. <laughs> um, so, but what brought me to this presentation is this book actually, Algorithms to Live By. Um, I was inspired by this one. It's written by Brian Christian and Tom Griffiths. And um, yeah, if you want to know more about it, just check it out. There is so much more about interesting algorithms that can yeah, cover basically every part of your life, not just scheduling and flood hunting. <laughs> so um, any questions? Get in touch with us on Slack. You saw already how you can do this, but also after the talk, it would be great if you can fill out our feedback forms because um, this is how we can improve and this will really help us making uh, PyLadies better for you. Okay. All right, I'll take over screen sharing. Yeah, yeah? you see it? Fantastic. Uh, and I'm actually going to adjust my laptop a bit because right now it is directly in front of my slides. And I can't see nothing. Hello, everyone. Um, oh, oh, adjust, adjust. Eh, close enough. Uh, hello, and welcome to my talk, which is going to be an intro to Bertology, uh, which I think will dovetail really nicely with uh, Betty's talk, which is going to go more in depth. So I, my goal here is to set you up to have a fairly good understanding of the general structure of the algorithm and what it does and what it's for. Uh, and then Betty will talk a lot more in depth about a specific uh, application. So there we go. Uh, I'm just going to lead with the headline. So we're going to talk about what BERT is, but these are the three things that I want you to remember about BERT. The first thing is that you can get equally good results with smaller models. Um, this has been uh, a consistent theme in the literature that's been published since the original BERT paper, which was by Jacob Deblin and co-authors and was, I guess, like shopped around. <laughs> so there was a press release um, earlier in the year and then it was published, published at, I believe, ACL 2019 uh, and received best paper. So very exciting. Um, so first of all, you can get equally good results with, second, with smaller models. Secondly, it is not a cognitive model. So it's not telling you what humans are doing and it's not doing things in a human-like way. And then third, we only know some of the security risks posed by BERT-based models. And I will say this doesn't just apply to BERT models. This is sort of all of the, the very large transformer language models um, like GPT-2 as well. So. If that was nonsense to you, let's start by talking about what Bert is. So uh, Bert is, of course, a Sesame Street character. He's the yellow one here, um, which is why you will see a yellow puppet with uh, discussions of this model. Uh, and what it is, is a specific large transformer masked language model. I say specific here because there are, at this point, many um, iterations and different models that follow the same sort of general training paradigm. Uh, and if you don't know what any of those words are, a language model is a uh, model of the statistical probability of a sentence or phrase, at least historically. And these have been around for a very long time. They're used in things especially like speech recognition. So in the process of speech recognition, you have your signal, you will produce a number of possible candidate phrases and words, and you will use a language model to say, oh, the phrase recognize speech, two words, is more likely than a phrase wreck, like destroy, a nice beach, like with the ocean. Um, and if you have a language model that's like, oh, one of these is more likely, you can pick that as your top candidate response. So they've been around for a couple of decades. Um, so here's an example. Uh, you could use a language model to tell you that the probability of Raza is open source. I work for Raza. It's an open source conversational AI platform, if you're interested, uh, is more likely than source is Raza open in an English, uh, English language, depending on 
some training corpus that you're using to create those probabilities. Masked language models aren't quite the same thing. Uh, and to be fair to the authors of the original BERT paper, they never say that they're creating a language model, but that's how it's been used. So a language model, a masked language model, uh, is trained by creating a bunch of uh, sentences from your corpus and then removing parts of them. So replacing them with a blank and then training the model to fill in the blank. Um, and BERT was also trained with a second task. So given two sentences, predict whether or not they occurred next to each other in the original source document. Um, further research has shown that the second task actually isn't that important and you can just remove it and not really change the model output that much. Um, so I'm not gonna talk about it. Uh, and probably the biggest contribution of BERT besides being very big is that it proposed this way of training language models. So this is also called a close task, C-L-O-Z-E, and it just means fill in the blank. Uh, and the reason that you would use a masked language model instead of something like a traditional statistical language model uh, is that you can use them to replace contextual word embeddings. Um, so most word embeddings are, I shouldn't say most, historically a lot of word embeddings are word vectors, which are numeric representations that approximate the meaning of a word and can be used as input to downstream natural language processing tasks. Basically, it's a way of turning a word into a number a computer can handle, um, have been based on this sort of bag of words model. So you don't uh, necessarily care uh, the order of the sentence that the word occurs in. A contextual language model, you do care about that. You do care about the larger document. And this is a way of representing and approximating the rest of the context for the word. Uh, and you, we've seen a lot of performance gains in various natural language processing tasks by using these contextual word embeddings to replace both original word embeddings and also increasingly language models. So you, you start with an input that's a little bit at a higher level. Uh, the specific architecture that was used to train this is called a transformer. So a transformer is a class of models like a convolutional neural network that you might see in computer vision or a recurrent neural network that was, uh, oh, well, I was in grad school, the state of the art for uh, natural language processing. And uh, now a lot of transformer models have seen really, really good uh, approaches as well. And I know Betty's going to talk a little bit more about the architecture, so I don't want to get too deep into it. Uh, but just a very brief overview of what's important about transformers. Uh, they don't consider order. They are trained using attention. So attention is a mechanism that given to objects assigns a weight between them. And for uh, transformers in particular, you take the input sequence and then you assign a weight for each item in the input sequence to each other item in the input sequence, and then you repeat that multiple times. So here, one head, one set of weights is purple, another head, another set of weights is um, gray. Hopefully those are colorblind compatible. I checked and they looked okay. Uh, and each of these lines, each of these weights is a combination of three matrices that are all learned. So query values and keys are what these are called. Um, it's not really a lookup based system. It's very much three things that are learned and then combined. The point of which is there's a lot of weights that you need to learn. There's a lot of parameters that you need to update. Uh, and BERT stacks a lot of transformer modules on top of each other. It is really, really big. It's very large. Uh, so BERT large, there were two versions in the original paper, the base and the large, has about 340 million trainable parameters. And you can compare that to Elmo, an early, con earlier contextual word embedding model that had about 93 million. So it was three to four times larger as the comparable models that it was um, being considered alongside. Uh, and in current research, the models are even bigger. So these are, these are chonkers. These are very, very large models. Uh, which brings us to what's happened since the paper has been published. There's been a lot of research. BERT um, achieved state of the art in a number of tasks very quickly. Um, and it was very exciting. And it's been an active area of research. Lots of competing models have been proposed. Um, and perhaps not everyone would pick these out as the top three insights, but I did. So you can get equally good results with smaller models. Uh, this figure is out of a fantastic paper that I highly recommend, A Primer in Bertology, What We Know About How BERT Works, uh, by Anna Rogers, Olga Kovaleva. I'm 
probably saying that incorrectly. My apologies. And Anna Rumchiski also probably saying that incorrectly. That's that's on me. Um, and this is a comparison of the models as of late 2019 that had been proposed to reduce the size of BERT, this very, very large model. So to dig a little bit more into this table, um, this particular set of models were trained using distillation. So distillation is an approach where you have a large model and you teach that, you treat that as a teacher basically. And then you have a smaller model and you train the smaller model to do the same thing as the large model. That could be based on the outputs of the large model. You could be basing it on trying to learn the same sort of set of weights. Um, and Distilbert, I think is probably the best known out of these set of models, at least in my, my little corner of Twitter. Um, Another uh, way of making BERT smaller is to use quantization. Um, so this is a way of reducing uh, precision in your weights, which also often reduces the memory footprint. Um, it does tend to be hardware specific, so it can be a little bit fiddly to get quantization right, but you can get a much smaller model with a much smaller memory footprint. And then there's also some just additional approaches that people have taken. And what I want you to notice out of this particular figure is that almost all of these models with the exception of Albert extra, extra large are smaller than the original BERT model. Some, some of them, you know, almost a hundred times smaller in terms of the, the, the size of the finished model. Uh, and they were also much faster. And I believe this is speed up time during training not speed up time at inference, uh, but since time on a computer is money in a very real sense, uh, this represents not only a savings of time, but also a significant soft savings, especially for something like VLSTM soft. However, even with a smaller model that's much faster to train, it would help if I went forward in the slides, uh, we still see performance that's roughly as good, uh, particularly because we don't tend to do sort of, um, any modeling of the spread of potential model performances because that would require training a model several times. And when it costs tens of thousands of dollars to train, no one's really interested in doing that. Um, it could be that these models are basically equivalent in terms of performance on these tasks. Um, the unfortunate thing is that it seems to not be the case that we can train a model that's smaller in the first place and use that one. Uh, people haven't been able to get as good of results as taking the very large model and then sort of shrinking that down and then using the shrunken model. Um, so trying to get a model that does as good as BERT on the first pass is very much an active research area. BERT is not a cognitive model. Uh, and I think if you are working in NLP, this might seem fairly straightforward, uh, but particularly given a lot of the press coverage uh, and the product questions you might get, I think this is very helpful to have in mind and be able to articulate. So what I mean by this is BERT and other masked language models and related models aren't human-like. They don't do things in the way that a human would. So, um, you can, if you do enough finagling, sort of get some linguistic structures out of the trained weights of BERT, uh, but it doesn't seem like these structures are being used in the same way that a human would. Um, so for example, uh, there's some research that was discussed uh, more in depth in the BERTology paper showing that, um, yes, sometimes there is an attention head that looks like it's like noticing sentences or something like that, it's finding structures. But if you remove that head, the performance of the model does not degrade significantly. Whereas if you remove a human's ability to understand sentence structure, um, that's a major language pathology. They, they can no longer communicate well. Uh, they're also not grounded. And I'm using grounded here in the specific NLP sense, meaning they don't have a um, like formal link to knowledge of how the world works, right? There's, there's no sense that knowledge in the way that a human has it is represented in BERT. Um, so you can use it to sort of guess using statistical cues, some things that might be true, like scientists discover stuff or engineers build things, but that doesn't mean that BERT has a model of scientists that includes, you know, discovery and looking for grant funding and all of the things that scientists do. 
Uh, and it's also not capable of reasoning. So uh, Bert cannot do addition. Um, so if you say, I, if I have two apples and I give one away, I will have blank apples. Um, it's possible that, well, okay, first of all, this would not be a good Q sentence because the second apples is plural and that's, that's uh, unreasonably tilting the model towards saying a number that's more than one. But um, there's lots of evidence that Bert can't do math, which is something that we would expect a model working in a human-like way to be able to do. Uh, and also, it can be really easily fined by these sort of spurious statistical correspondences. So uh, in this paper by Timothy Nevin and uh, Hong Yu Kao from uh, ACL 2019, they found that uh, BERT seemed to be doing surprisingly well on some of some reading comprehension tasks. And what it was actually doing was uh, to find out if something was negative or not, it was looking for the word not, which I think is a reasonable statistical approach to take, but does not mean that BERT was doing reasoning about negation, if that makes sense. So don't expect human-like things from BERT. Uh, and one thing that I think can be kind of helpful here, especially in uh, explaining the limitations of these models, is to describe them as if they had some sort of aphasia. So they can produce language, it sounds fluent and human-like, but there's no real understanding of meaning. Um, and if you're not familiar, Wernicke's aphasia, uh, sufferers who have recovered have they can produce fluent-sounding language, uh, but after recovery, they they mentioned that language sounded like bird song to them. It didn't have any grounded meaning. So uh, yeah, uh, and there's a quick question which I'm gonna answer now. Uh, Wiggly Till says, do you think knowledge has to be represented as a knowledge model that works together with a language model? Or do you think it will be grounded enough just given working parameters? Um, will it be grounded enough for your purposes? That's a good question. Um, would I trust Bert to generate a legal defense for me? Absolutely not. I would trust no language model to do that. Um, do I trust Bert or related language models to produce like creative writing prompts? Yeah, probably. So I think it really depends on your specific needs and why you're using this model. So, all right, uh, and finally, uh, and this is something that I think is becoming more widely discussed and investigated in the NLP community. We really only know some of the security risks posed by BERT-based models, um, and not just BERT, all these sort of large mass language models. Uh, and one paper that I just would like people to know about um, is this Universal Triggers paper, which is out of Allen NLP, which is also in Seattle. Uh, and they found that there were discoverable, so learnable triggers, little phrases, that if you uh, fed them to models, and I actually don't think they looked at BERT, I think they looked at uh, GPT-2, uh, but very, very similar if you're using them for language generation, um, these models could change the, these little phrases could change the model output. Um, so they could change the prediction of the model. Um, I haven't shared samples of this because they're very disturbing, but they could also create language generation that was explicitly racist or homophobic or abusive. Um, and we know that things like this, we also know there's a recent paper at ICLR showing that if you're serving a BERT model through an API um, with a relatively few number of calls, someone could reconstruct that model, um, which suggests if you're trying to use a, a language model like this to you know, create a competitive advantage, it's, that's not gonna work for you. It will be uh, very discoverable and copyable. Uh, and this is very much an active area. So I, uh, it's just good to know, right? So three main points here, um, you can get equally good results with smaller models that are sort of shrunk versions of BERT. I probably wouldn't recommend um, for most non-research purposes just using straight up plain BERT, uh, personally. Uh, it's not a cognitive model, it's not going to do human-like things. It may occasionally do human-like things by accident, but that doesn't mean that it's doing language, capital L. Uh, and we really only know some of the security risks posed by BERT-based models. Uh, and I imagine more of those will become, will come to light in the future. Um, and I wanna, I, it's one of the things that I was saying were pretty negative. I'm not trying to tear down BERT. It's a really important model. It's a seminal paper in NLP. Um, it's made a large impact on the field. It's been put into production in a number of different situations where it's dramatically improved results. 
Uh, but we have a lot to learn about this uh, particular area of research. Um, it's very young. Transformers were only proposed in 2017. There's a lot that we don't know yet. Um, so it's good to continue our, our learning. All right. Uh, thank you. Questions. I do see one here from, ooh, maybe Frida Pie or maybe Fried Appy. I don't know which one it is. Uh, what do you mean by knowledge here? Um, so I will say that knowledge in particular is not my specific area of uh, NLP, but a former structural representation of relationships between items in the world. Um, so knowledge might include things like um, Spain is in Europe or Spain is a country or fire is hot or you can't eat fire. So those sort of um, common sense reasoning things that humans know and humans learn, but are much harder to represent formally in, uh, in NLP applications. Uh, Julia says, in the end, would you say that specific classifiers or named inter entity recognition, or et cetera, are better based in a language model than in an embedding model? Hmm. That's a really great question. Uh, I would say in general, I would recommend using contextual embeddings at this point. Uh, if you have, if they've been trained on a large corpus, I would say for a small, like a low resource language, um, there's evidence that you need a lot of data to train contextual embeddings. And if you don't have access to all that data, uh, like for, I don't know, Cherokee, I would probably use regular word embeddings. For English, I would definitely use contextual word embeddings at this point, uh, just because the, the results that have been shown with those word embeddings tend to be better than a bag of word. Uh, yeah, so if you have sufficient training data, I would say contextual word embeddings and mass language models are better. If you don't, stick with um, bag of word embeddings. Are there any questions from the Slack? Because I'm not in it. <laughs> no questions? All right. Uh, thank you. If you develop any questions in the future, please feel free to reach out on me on Twitter. I am R-C-U-T-A-T-M-A-N, um, which is also what I am on Twitch. Uh, if you want to tune into some of my live coding. Uh, I have one tomorrow at 9 a.m. Pacific, which is, I believe, 6 p.m. CEST. So, all right. Thank you so much. Hello again. Welcome back to An Evening with Bert. Thanks for staying with us. That's awesome. We're going to have our next speaker now. Betty is going to um, give us more insights on the Bert model. And yeah, I'm going to head over now. Thanks. Um, just to make sure everybody's seeing my screen. Okay. Uh, so hi, uh, my name is Betty, and um, I'm also working in NLP. And um, actually, uh, what I want to talk about is um, something my colleague and I were wondering like a year ago um, when we were doing question answering. And that was, how does Bird answer questions? And this actually led to a uh, look inside um, uh, BERT and uh, BERT for question answering. Um, let's start with a short um, introduction of myself. Um, this is me on a rainy day and um, I'm a research assistant and a PhD student at uh, Boyd University in Berlin um, since two years now. Um, and I was working on different fields, started with hate speech detection, um, then question answering, and currently, as Heike already mentioned, um, I'm looking into um, medical data, um, especially clinical data, uh, which is also a very interesting field. Um, but today, I want to talk about question answering. And um, just to be on the same page with everyone, um, I want to make sure what question answering actually means for us here. So how do we define this task? And yeah, it all starts with a question, of course. Uh, so let's say the question is, where does the wine begin? Um, and then we also um, have a context document, uh, which is, for example, a Wikipedia article. 
Um, and you can already see like uh, this bold text. Um, we need to have the answer to the question in this text um, so that our model can later tell us, well, the answer to this is Swiss Canton of Graubünden. Um, and what this looks to our model to BERT later is that the left part, the question and the context will be the input to the model and the answer will be the output. So that's basically um, more of a, a reading comprehension task because we already tell the model everything it needs to know. Uh, it just has to extract the right answer to our question. So um, why even talk about explainability of transformers for question answering? Um, well, um, as I said, me and my colleague um, were into question answering like a year or one and a half years ago. And um, we were analyzing baselines, how everything works out. And then suddenly there was BERT and there were transformer models. Um, and they were all of a sudden state of the art in a lot of NLP tasks, but also in question answering. Um, but on the other side, um, most of the people um, using them didn't really know what of information is stored inside these models and how these models actually um, hold all these knowledge or not knowledge, we don't know, um, but they were basically black boxes. And um, so this posed the question, how does the model get to the right answer? Um, and I think in order to understand we, um, what's coming, uh, we first have to uh, look at the BERT architecture now. So um, I think the most important um, part to understand is that BERT is uh, built of uh, these encoder blocks. Um, so what you see in this uh, yellow line is the basic BERT model. Um, and as an input, we give BERT some tokens. Um, so uh, I will call words tokens because it can also be a single characters like this dot. Um, we will have some special tokens uh, like the class token, the separator token, but I don't think you have to care about them too much right now. Um, for question answering, the separator token is, uh, for example, important uh, to tell the model what is the question and what is the context. So um, we give the model all these tokens uh, of our question, where does the wine begin, and uh, of the Wikipedia article, our context. Um, and then these tokens just go through the model through uh, each encoder layer. And after each encoder layer, you will have um, a different representation for each token. And when I say representation, I actually just mean a vector here. Um, so uh, each token will get a vector. Uh, and after each encoder block, this vector will change somehow. Um, so uh, yeah, that's uh, I think the first important thing to understand about the model is that um, the representation of an input token, uh, like where, um, changes in each layer of the model. Um, and then uh, we have this output layer uh, where we have another representation for each of the tokens. And what we can do um, is uh, we just stack, uh, stack two classifiers um, on top of all these representations. And the first classifier uh, should tell us what is the probability for each token to be the first, like the start token of our answer. And then the second one does the same with the end token. So if we have um, a well-trained model, um, this classifier uh, will give the word Swiss the highest probability. And this one will give Graubünden the highest probability. Um, and the words in between, we can actually just infer from, from our context. Um, and then we have the answer. So this content of Um So uh, if, if you have understood this basic setup, uh, because it's, it's somehow important to understand what we have done uh, in the next steps, um, uh, there's an additional thing to understand that um, these representation changes of each words uh, happens with regard to the token's context. And um, Rachel has already um, talked about uh, self-attention and that's what is, is important here. So each of these tokens get a different representation after each encoder layer. And uh, that is 
with regard to its context. So um, whether this word is Netherlands or not actually matters to the representation of the wear. Um, and this goes along uh, with all uh, layers uh, for bird base. We have 12 layers. So it's, um, as Rachel has already pointed out, um, it's a very large model and this is only bird base. Um, and so we have a lot of transformations in here. So um, we're getting from this um, token representation uh, to the final output token representation. Um, and what we were actually wondering is, what are these transformations like? So they give the transformer model the names. Um, um, we want to consider these encoder blocks um, as black boxes, but want to understand what happens after each encoder. So um, just another thing for bird for question answering, um, the usual approach to get to a good model um, is just to pick a pre-trained model on a large language corpora. There's this model that probably everybody uh, knows and a lot of people using is a pre-trained model from Google. Um, the first one that was actually released and started this whole bird hype. Um, and when we took this model that is pre-trained on, I think, um, Common Crawl, Wikipedia, uh, a lot of large copper. Um, then we can fine tune this model on a specific task like question answering in our case. So just to understand that there's this pre-training step and then the fine tuning step where we uh, actually use the model for question answering. So what we were asking ourselves uh, at this point um, where we just saw that BERT actually works very well for question answering was what is actually happening in these different layers of BERT? So what is BERT doing? Is it um, some kind of reasoning that is happening in these layers or what is actually happening? Um, then we were wondering what kind of language knowledge is encoded in BERT. Um, so what does BERT actually understand about the language? And we wanted to know what fine tuning, um, how fine tuning affects our model uh, and what it actually learns in this fine tuning step. So our approach was to um, first uh, have a quantitative analysis um, where we applied probing tasks uh, and then a qualitative analysis uh, where we are trying to actually look inside of these hidden layers. Um, and I'm going to start with um, the probing task setup. Um, but first, I'm going to introduce our data sets. Um, so in order to get like a good picture of uh, question answering, uh, we chose three uh, pretty diverse data sets. So um, we have uh, one that is pretty easy. Um, it's called the Bobby tasks from Facebook. Um, then when you have, um, one of the most uh, famous question answering data sets called Squat. Uh, and we have Hotpot QA, which is a pretty difficult uh, data set with a very large context. And just to give you an idea of um, how these uh, data sets look like, um, this is an example from Bobby. Um, and you can see that Bobby has actually um, generated um, contexts and questions. So it's not really natural language, um, but uh, these different body tasks actually help to better understand um, these reasoning steps of BERT. So in this case, uh, we have John moved to the office, Sandra moved to the hallway, uh -huh -huh. and then the question is, where is Sandra? So the model has to find this uh, supporting fact where um, the context says Sandra traveled to the kitchen. Um, another thing is what, where we have mostly like paragraphs from Wikipedia article. Uh, and questions like, where does the wine begin? And these questions were actually uh, created by humans. Uh, and then Hotpot QA um, has not only a single uh, paragraph, but multiple paragraphs from Wikipedia article, um, also with uh, dis distracting paragraphs. So paragraphs with equal words, but different meaning. Uh, and we have uh, so-called multi-hop questions. Um, so, for example, this one, what award did President Barack Obama give to the author of the work on being? And uh, multi-hop in this case means that um, you have to an first answer the question, who is the author of the work on being, before you can answer the actual question, what award was given to him or her. 
Um, so this um, is the, the uh, most difficult uh, data set of the three. Um, and we tried our approaches on all three of them. So um, back to probing tasks. Um, what we did here was applying five different probing tasks that we assumed are related to question answering. So um, we kind of thought about how NLP learners did question answering uh, back in the days uh, in a kind of a pipeline approach where they first extracted entities, then relations, and then um, like the rest of the pipeline. Um, and we orientated our probing task on this approach um, to understand what of these tasks BERT actually already includes in its parameters. Um, and we wanted to test the abilities of BERT in each layer to understand what is really happening in each layer. Um, and we also compared the tree trained BERT model um, with the BERT model without any fine tuning. So uh, this model without any fine tuning does not know anything about question answering at all. So um, now to um, the question, what are probing tasks actually? What, uh, how do they work? Um, so um, the first set of probing tasks that we chose are pretty common natural language processing tasks, um, entity recognition, coreference resolution, and relation extraction. Uh, and the idea of the whole thing is that we imagine we have um, a set of vectors, uh, like the yellow ones here, um, that belong to a sentence like Obama traveled to his birthplace, Honolulu. And um, we want to find out if uh, these vectors contain the information uh, whether Obama and Honolulu are entities. So if we have um, vectors that have a lot of knowledge about entities uh, in language, um, then we assume that um, a classifier that is learned on top of these vectors, so with only these vectors as, as an input, uh, will be able to actually recognize the, those as entities. And if there's um, no information at all about uh, one of these words being an entity, a classifier on top of this will fail. Um, so the same we are doing with coreference resolution, um, where in this case, um, the classifier uh, would have to recognize that his is a coreference to Obama. And then relation extraction, uh, I think it's like the most difficult of the three uh, probing tasks. Um, where the classifier on top of these vectors um, actually has to recognize um, that Honolulu um, and Obama are uh, connected with a relation that was born in. So um, about these three uh, probing tasks, we were just wondering um, if BERT learns them during pre-training and in which layers. And then there was a second set of probing tasks uh, that we uh, built uh, to address a specifically question answering. Um, and this is the question type identification, where um, we uh, have a question as an input and um, the classifier uh, that is doing the probing um, must classify whether this question is asking for a location or a person, or I think there was a number. Um, so this is like a thing that you would expect a very good question answering model to actually get. Um, so uh, that's why we added this as a probing task. And then the last one um, is the extraction of supporting facts. Um, I have already shown supporting facts in Babi, but um, in this case, we would have um, input as a question and the context. And if the question is, where did Obama travel to? The classifier should have to tell that he traveled to Honolulu is the supporting fact, because um, the sentence does not, um, the Obama lives in Washington DC sentence does not hold information uh, regarding this question. So this is our probing task set up. Um, and this is actually the architecture that we um, applied uh, to do this probing. So you can uh, recognize this is just um, the set of encoding layers. And this is the answer span prediction that I showed at the beginning. And now um, we, for the probing, we're 
don't actually want to do the question answering, but uh, we send all the tokens in. And then uh, after each layer, uh, take this representation for each tokens. Um, so the layer output and feed it into this classification um, layer. Um, and this, uh, it doesn't really matter if there's a sigmoid or a softmax. Um, you just have to understand that this is like a very basic classifier that does not have um, a lot of power on its own. Um, and by applying this to every layer, we can actually measure how uh, much of these, um, these probing information is encoded uh, in each of, after each of these layers. So let's look at the results. Um, this uh, is for the basic language knowledge tasks. And uh, first to get an idea about these graphs, um, on the left side, you see the accuracy in F1. And um, the x-axis um, are the layer of bird. And then we have a uh, yellow curve is uh, a model uh, fine-tuned on squat. Um, the blue one is uh, fine-tuned on Barbie and the green dotted one has no fine-tuning at all. And what we can see here is that the ability um, to recognize entities in these vectors and coreferences and actually almost uh, also relations um, is the same for all three models. So we can actually uh, see that the ability uh, to extract these informations or to encode these informations uh, within the vectors um, doesn't really change. Um, so what we can learn from this is that um, this, uh, these tasks are all pretty much covered in the pre-training step and we don't even need fine tuning to be better on these tasks. Let's see how this looks for the question um, answering related probing tasks. There we have a bit of a different image. Um, let's first look at the question type. Um, this uh, I found really interesting um, because we can see here that um, the squat model um, actually pretty much outperforms the model without any fine tuning but the Barbie model performs worse than it. Um, so we can actually uh, infer from this that um, for squat, is a, it is uh, pretty important to know the question type um, and to know if, uh, if the question asks for a location or for a person. Um, but for Barbie, it's actually not important at, at all. And if we later look at uh, another Barbie example, you can also see that um, the question word is not really uh, important. It is just uh, different patterns uh, that the model can look at and uh, will solve the problem even better. Um, so in this case, uh, we can see that during fine tuning, abilities can only uh, also uh, be forgotten. Um, for supporting facts uh, for the squad and the Barbie model, um, we see that both of the fine-tuned model outperform the not fine-tuned model um, by a large margin. So for both of uh, Squat and Bobby, um, this supporting fact extraction or detection of which facts in the context are important to answering the question uh, is actually uh, a pretty important thing uh, for answering the question in the end. Um, yeah, so in the end, the probing showed us um, that there are indeed important information uh, pre-trained in BERT, um, just like uh, information about uh, entities, relations, and co-references. And that fine-tuning only teaches domain and or especially task-specific knowledge. So um, it can also uh, lead to forgetting some of the knowledge that was learned uh, during pre-training. We have also seen that um, layers in the network are differently uh, perf performing differently well um, on uh, the different tasks. So, for example, we have seen that relation extraction is something that uh, can only be done well in the later layers. Um, and we were wondering at this step um, if we can somehow observe this process of first uh, forming entities, then relations throughout the layers. So that's how we got to our next step. 
um, which is the qualitative analysis, um, where we actually tried to look into hidden layers. Um, I, I put this picture here um, again, uh, just to um, show what we are looking at right now. Um, and this is actually this part um, and this part also this part, uh, but we are looking at the vectors that we get out of uh, each encoder. Um, and because there's not a lot we know about these vectors, um, I mean, we know the dimension is pretty high. It's like um, 768 uh, to 1024. Uh, so very high dimensional vectors. Um, they, they live in their own vector space, basically. We don't have any reference. We don't know that if this vector points to direction A, this means uh, a specific topic or anything. Um, so the only thing we can kind of look at um, are the relative changes between those vectors. So we cannot really tell uh, what this vector and vector space means, but we can uh, tell uh, whether it's moving apart from this vector uh, or the other, or moving closer to another vector. So we are looking at the relative changes. Um, and to actually look at them, we apply a dimensionality reduction. Um, in this case, we chose PCA because um, it gave us good clusters and it's actually uh, practical because uh, it's pretty fast and um, we wanted to um, uh, do this uh, like on unseen samples as well. That's why uh, we chose the PCA in this case. So um, what we're doing now is, uh, one step back, what we're doing now is um, looking at each sample individually. So um, we want to um, uh, push each sample through our network and look at uh, what these vectors are doing, how they behave in relation to each other. Um, and uh, I just want to show you on one Bobby example because um, the nice thing about Bobby is that there are not so many tokens and you can um, actually uh, use them uh, well to analyze them uh, without too much mess. Um, and in this case, uh, we have also like a typical Bobby example a context that says wolves are afraid of cats, sheep are afraid of wolves, and so on. And then Emily is a wolf. Um, and the question here is, what is Emily afraid of? So um, what we do have here is another multi-hop uh, question, because the model has first, uh, at first un must understand that um, Emily is a wolf. And then that wolves are afraid of cats and therefore Emily is afraid of cats. So um, that's what this example looks like. Um, and what we did is to push this example through our uh, Bobby pre-trained model uh, and just look at, in this case, the first, the second layer of our model and see what the PCA would give us. Um, and what we found was actually um, pretty um, decent phases of development in this vector space. So um, at first we would see like topical word clusters, just like you would expect it from uh, Virtuvec, for example, um, like a topical embedding. Um, here you have a cluster with names and here you have one with animals um, and they are not really uh, contextual right now. Um, but at phase two, we can already see that there are some contextual, uh, contextuality coming in. Um, and we could see that there, here, for example, is a cluster that contains um, the word Emily uh, and the uh, tokens for wolf and wolves and is a. So uh, the model actually clustered these tokens together in about layer five. And we could see um, these entity mentioned clusters um, or attribute clusters a lot uh, in these models. Um, but one thing that we have seen more often uh, was actually the phase three, um, where we have um, the tokens of the question, which are here um, 
uh, actually shown with little stars in orange, match together with the tokens of the supporting facts. Um, the supporting factor here in uh, Suan. Um, and uh, this actually surprised us um, because uh, we didn't expect the models to be so, uh, I don't know, like uh, showing off what they are looking at so much. Um, but we have really seen that uh, most of the time, uh, the question tokens were just mapped uh, in the same direction of the vector space with the supporting facts tokens. And in this case, uh, cats is the actual answer. Um, and uh, this also, so the, the answer is already part of this supporting fact. Um, then in phase four, uh, we had a different picture. We just saw that the answer token was clearly separated from the rest of the tokens. Um, and all other clusters were basically dissolved at this point. Um, this makes kind of sense because um, as you remember, we only have like this one layer on top of, um, of uh, BERT to classify which tokens are the start and the end words. Um, and in order to give this final layer a good idea about what the model has produced, um, it's actually extracting the very important tokens um, and separating them from the rest. So um, for us, uh, this whole thing was kind of a surprise already because uh, we didn't really expect uh, to um, have the meanings of these tokens uh, still present in the output layer. So um, um, as I said, it kind of makes sense, but um, because we really don't know a lot about these transformations that are happening in between, it could also be completely different. Um, so in this case, um, BERT actually helps us to gain some understanding about um, what is happening to our tokens. Um, and what we uh, did out of this was uh, building a little visualization tool um, to observe uh, transformations for um, any samples we want, uh, also for adversarial examples. And I'm just gonna give you a short uh, demo here. Um, I don't know if this is, yeah, I'm going to zoom in a bit. Um, so um, we have uh, this small demo where you can actually choose which data set you want to look at, um, squats, hot pot, or barbecue. Um, and you have filled in here some, um, some questions from the test sets of these models. For example, uh, who's the producer of Doctor Who? And then we have the context and this, there's a pretty uh, short context uh, and the ground truth answer also from Squat's test set. And now let's see what the model makes out of this. Ah, so it predicted uh, the correct answer, uh, BBC. And now we can actually look at these token representations in a bit uh, easier way. So um, let's start here with layer zero. Uh, we can see we have some, um, some word clusters here, doctor, for example. Um, we also have articles clustered here, the and a, uh, like punctuation and everything, but we don't see a lot of contextuality yet. Let's see how they behave um, if we go through layer two, three, um, four, and five. And uh, now we see there was actually something happening. Um, and one thing that uh, we see is, for example, that uh, here's a cluster that uh, has clustered the doctor together with the who. So um, there's some sort of understanding, uh, also BBC got closer to it, uh, that doctor who is something like a belonging entity. Um, and yeah, we also have something else like program and series um, and so on time and space uh, and traveling um, is also clustered together. Uh, and now let's see how this further behaves. So at this point, um, we actually see this typical behavior um, that the question tokens uh, that are uh, in blue here, 
um, are matched together with the supporting facts tokens in Cyan as well. Um, so if you just um, hide the, all the other context tokens, you see that they kind of uh, moved into the same direction in vector space. Uh, and this is the point where we can see that the model has probably uh, chosen to look at the right part of the context. If we go further, um, we will see that, yeah, BBC is finally extracted from the West. Um, and this is actually um, something everybody can play around with to uh, control their models and to see what is actually happening to these tokens, how are they transformed? Um, and because uh, it's always funny if you just choose your own example, um, I would just try, yeah, I get the Ernie and Bird uh, Wikipedia article and just copy a bit from it. Let's see. So this is a small paragraph about Bird, about its uh, puppeteers. And then in the end it says Bird has one large eyebrow known as the unibar. And I would just ask uh, what is Bird's famous facial feature. Um, and you can see that facial feature is not really uh, mentioned here. So um, uh, uh, exact match search would not give us a lot. And I'm just gonna uh, put into the ground truth answer eyebrow uh, because um, the ground truth answer is actually optional but it helps us to see uh, the supporting fact in the end. And let's see what the model makes of this. Okay, so uh, we see it didn't uh, choose the eyebrow, but the unibrow, which is actually more specific. Um, and so let's scroll uh, quickly through the layers. Um, we have like a, a bird cluster here. Um, if we move a bit, uh, we can see that uh, those puppeteers and the names uh, are matched together. Um, and then we again have this matching of question and supporting fact at this point. And in the end, um, we see, uh, this is a bit of a different um, picture. Uh, just as a short explanation, uh, unibrow is uh, in this case actually uh, tokenized into word pieces. So uh, for words that Bird uh, doesn't know from its vocabulary, um, it creates uh, word pieces like this uh, so that um, uh, it is kind of created into known parts of the word like uh, an, ip, et, wo, uh, but together it forms the word unibrow. And here we see that unibrow was not so clearly separated, but there was also another token uh, called that is the eyebrow that is separated. Uh, and this way we can actually often see that uh, potential other candidates uh, that are maybe like pre pretty close in the final scoring of answer tokens um, are often uh, together uh, with these uh, extracted tokens. So it also helps us to, um, uh, to guess that in this part, um, the model would also have taken one large eyebrow uh, as a possible answer if there weren't for the Europe wow. Um, yeah, so uh, I think uh, this is uh, something that, yeah, maybe uh, anyone uh, who wants can play around with it. I found it pretty interesting uh, to look at these faces and also to look at what happens to all these other tokens. Um, but let's get back. Um, so um, I just wanted to show you some additional findings um, we had in this uh, process. Um, one thing is that we could uh, actually recognize failure states um, earlier in the model. So in this case, in layer seven, we could see that uh, the question tokens were not matched against the actual supporting facts tokens here in uh, Sion, but against a different fact. And therefore, uh, the model concluded uh, to get to uh, a wrong answer. 
Um, so uh, that was pretty interesting to see that you could probably stop at layer seven uh, to uh, actually get this um, idea where the model looks for right uh, answers. And another thing was that um, we could see a lot of this positional encoding that is uh, added uh, at the first uh, bird layer uh, still in later layers. So uh, bird, uh, especially for squat, uh, took a lot of weight um, into sentence belonging. So in this case, you see for each sentence, there's a different color. Um, and you can really see that these clusters are pretty sentence-based. And um, this is uh, partly uh, what we uh, uh, suspect uh, because Squat is actually a pretty sentence-based uh, data set. So uh, you will only need one sentence and uh, to answer a question. And so um, for, for the board model, it makes sense to actually uh, keep to this sentence structure. So um, what were our findings from uh, looking into BERT this way? Um, we found that um, these hidden representations of transformer models can actually give us some insights about the inner workings. Um, and uh, shows us something about the phases uh, that um, the models or the tokens go through uh, in order to answer a question. Um, and it also helps us to learn something about the strength and shortcomings, even if it's only uh, qualitative, but it can uh, pretty much help us to get uh, nudged into the right direction to look for um, possible biases or for uh, adversarial attacks um, that might change something in the way uh, these phases go through the model. Um, so for future work, uh, we um, thought about uh, going into checking first what is missing actually from uh, our pre-trained model. Um, and uh, see if we can add to fine tuning only the tasks that are missing. Um, another interesting thing for us was this uh, modularity. So um, that you could think that some tasks might already be solved earlier in the model um, and you don't have to run through all of the layers. Um, and then we also want to look at uh, how we could actually use um, this uh, interpretable information that we found um, in order for um, like uh, decision legitimization or um, to detect cases where the model might be right for the wrong reason. Yeah, and I think there's um, still a lot to do in this field, uh, still a lot uh, that is unclear about BERT and how it works. Um, yeah, but um, I, I hope I have given you a bit of an insight into how, how these models could be like unpacked um, and how we can um, get some knowledge out of this. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, you're very welcome to uh, try out the demo tool. And uh, we have also published a paper about this work. So if you wanna um, read uh, things up later, um, yeah, I'll be happy uh, to uh, uh, to uh, point you to this. Um, but I am also happy if you have any questions now, which I can answer. Uh, yeah, I think we have a couple of questions in the Twitch chat. Um, LRSS asks, um, do you know, do you also know how good BERT models work for German question answering? Oh, that's, that's an interesting point. Um, uh, we haven't tried it on German um, uh, yet, but um, there's this um, Berlin uh, startup called DeepSet, uh, and we're working uh, a bit with them. Um, and um, they have built this farm framework, uh, especially for question answering and German uh, question answering as well. So um, this is actually, uh, the farm framework is uh, a good uh, possibility to just get uh, your hidden layers from, uh, from any German models, uh, which you could plug in into our tool. So um, yeah, uh, I haven't tried it out, but um, I think there are um, a lot of possibilities to try this out. 
Cool. With a bit of coding. Yeah, we um, uh, also have a question from Microservice and a kind of related one from IRSS. Um, Microservice asks, if the task is quote unquote done in earlier layers, does this mean that we could reduce the size of the model significantly by under understanding exactly where that done happens? Yeah, I think so. Um, I mean, of course, um, it also varies uh, per sample. So for sample, some samples, um, we might uh, get to the answer more quick than for others. Um, but I think there's already work uh, on this uh, reduction of just cutting off layers um, to, yeah, to reduce our model sizes or at least to reduce our inference times. Um, I don't have uh, the very paper um, uh, in mind, but um, uh, I, I'm happy to look it up and then post in the Slack channel, for example, because uh, I found this work very interesting. Cool, thank you. Yeah, and um, IRSS also asks in a kind of related vein, um, could you theoretically improve learning with stopping the fine tuning at an earlier stage if failure seems probable? Yeah, that's that's also a very interesting question. Um, uh, I think uh, it should be possible, um, especially to look at what your fine tuning is doing. I mean, uh, you have something like catastrophic forgetting already that uh, you would delete information that was learned during pre-training, but that you don't want to lose. Um, but uh, yeah, I, th I think. Uh, the thing that uh, just comes to mind is um, just taking care of uh, not having catastrophic forgetting when fine tuning. Um, but there might be other things, other ways to think about it. Cool, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Betty. Thanks, Rachel. That was um, just awesome. I don't know about you guys out there i just learned a lot <laughs> and um i just have to let this sink in that was just really cool stuff um yeah and in the meantime <laughs> if you gonna uh, want to uh get in touch with betty or rachel um you can reach them and you can reach us on our slack channel and on meetup and on on twitter and via email and we also have a facebook page so um, yeah, get in touch and collect your questions. Um, yeah, we're ready to answer them. And the two of them are most happy to answer more technical questions on BERT, I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so, but one more thing before you go, <laughs> you can really help us um, with feedback. So fill out, please, our feedback forms. Um, that really helps us to collect more topics that you maybe want to hear and um, yeah, it helps us to, to make this format yeah, more suitable. And you can also register with a new chapter uh, for Pirate Ladies, actually. So if you're not in Karlsruhe or Berlin or Munich or Hamburg and you yeah, want to join Pirate Ladies, uh, you can check out the link on this slide. Also. So thank you very much for staying with us. Um, yeah, I hope you had a great evening. And see you soon. Thank you. Bye-bye.